already had my glasses off. Go ahead, Linda. Linda? I'm going to walk up the aisle so I can hear you. Linda wants to know how it is possible for a person to be accountable for and even to do in his life sins which are actively and deliberately expressions of hatred to God when God has chosen his people from all eternity. That's, that's it, isn't it? Partially. Oh. I, I want to know those that God hates. Um, how is it just for oh. them that they are still held accountable in spite of the fact that God from eternity hated them? I see. You're talking about the wicked, yes. not the people of God. Well, you know, Linda, that's an entirely different question. That's a question that involves the question of the absolute sovereignty of God, particularly in the decree of reprobation and the remaining and inevitable and necessary accountability of man. And our canons deal with that. And that's a question which the church has struggled with from the time of Augustine, in fact, before that. And there are answers to that question, but I like the way the canons say it. They don't put it in these words, but this is the argument of the canons, especially in the conclusion. When you talk about the relationship between God's sovereignty and sin, now let's make it more specific. When you talk about the decree of reprobation and sin, you may not say that reprobation is the cause of sin because that makes God the author of sin. Nor may you say that sin is the cause of reprobation because that's our many. So our fathers, confronted with that, spoke of the relationship very carefully and very consciously in this way. God sovereignly uh, executes the decree of reprobation, and then these three words, in the way of sin. And they said, we can't say anything more about it than that. Man remains accountable for sin, for his sin, accountable for his fall in Adam. God is sovereign. God sovereignly works out reprobation in the way of man's sin for which he remains accountable. And I can't go beyond the canons. I've probably answered this question more than a hundred times in catechism class. It's always the big, big question. But both have to be maintained. 
So that's all I can say. Anyone else? Any questions? Sin is only absence of goodness. Yes. Christine wants to know whether sin is only absence of goodness. <laughs> no, sin is a whole lot worse than that. It's an absence of goodness, a total absence of goodness. But it's active. It's done purposely. Deliberately, it has its source in hatred of God. It's an act. It's an act of shaking your fist in God's face. It's a, an act of knowing what God commands and spitting in his face. That's what sin is. Always. It's not a mere absence of goodness. That was really taught already way, way back by the Gnostics. But that's not what Scripture says about sin. No, it's worse than that, much worse. Anyone else? Yes? Greg? Do you have a question? Whose hand was up? Somebody asking you a question? Oh, you! so that he could sin? That's a good question. For a young man like you, that's a good question. This young man wants to know why God created man so that he could sin. Why didn't God create man so that he couldn't sin? What would seem to be a lot better, don't you think? So that he couldn't sin. Yeah. God did that because God is sovereign and does everything he pleases. And God's purpose was to reveal the greatness of his grace, mercy, and love in Christ, in his Son. And revealing those riches of his own glorious being in Christ, God also determined that sin should. Sin wasn't a mistake. God had sin in his counsel too. And God did that ultimately for the glory of his own name. Okay? I understand that? Thank you for asking that question. That was a good one. What a fine young man. Yes. Sin starts in the mind and soul. Paul talks about taking every thought captive. Have you any advice about how we take thought captive? How we take the thoughts of the wicked captive? No, how we take our own thoughts captive. Captive. Put them in the service. Kennedy wants to know how we make our thoughts captive. I think the text says captive to the word of God, doesn't it? So we make our thoughts captive to the Word of God. That the Word of God controls and directs all our thoughts. That's what that means. I think that's in uh, Corinthians. When Paul talks about the believer casting down bastions of the wicked. Yeah. Wow.
Yeah. Uh, question. Uh, sure. our, our nature, uh, we're totally depraved. And I wonder if you could expand a little bit on how the devil uh, works with or in our human natures. I guess what I'm wondering is I've always assumed or believed that our human natures are capable, obviously, of sin without the devil being in front of us with the apple as it were. How, can you give a little, a little light on, on that? Or Sid wants to know how with our own sinful and depraved natures, which are prone to all evil, the devil works with that nature so that he becomes the source of temptation. How does that work? You know, I've often thought about that question, Sid, and I don't think the Bible says anything about precisely what role our own natures play and what role the devil plays in the sins of which we are guilty. I can't find anything on that. But our natures are so corrupt and depraved that sinful thoughts and sinful desires and sinful acts can arise right out of our natures. They don't need the devil to stimulate them. That's possible and perhaps frequently happens. Nevertheless, Satan is, according to Scripture, the source. He has access, because we are sinful, to our minds and to our wills. And because he has access to our minds and wills, he's the author of uh, Many, many sins we commit. He suggests these things, especially the temptations of the world and the pressures of our peers to go along with the world. Where the devil doesn't need any of his demons to prod us to sin so that our own flesh is wicked enough without him, where that line can be drawn, I'm not sure. But it doesn't make any difference. I do know that Peter warns us two times. Watch out for the Satan for Satan. Resist the devil. So he's there. And he's there a lot. I don't know if he's got enough devils to assign one devil to each person. I don't know. But he's always there. He's always lurking. He's always waiting for a moment to pounce. And that's why, well, you remember that story of the Lord where he talked about a house that was filled with devils and the owner of the house chased the devils out and swept it clean and refurbished it, but he didn't put anything in it. And seven other devils, worse than the first, came in. Our minds may be free of evil momentarily in an active sense of the word. But if we don't fill it with the word of God, and we don't meditate on things heavenly, and we don't in our life, so to speak, have the spirit working in our minds, it's empty. And an empty mind is a playground for the devil, and he rushes in and fills it with his ideas because there's nothing else there. So there's that about it too. It isn't hard for the devil to stir up necessarily evil thoughts, but the spirit is there. And the devil is consciously fighting the spirit. And so the devil plays a major role in his efforts to defeat the spirit, we don't. We don't help the devil defeat the spirit, but the devil tries, and he has our sinful flesh 
as an instrument to be astonishingly successful because our flesh is prone to all evil. So don't forget, the devil is warring against the spirit in us and, of course, to destroy us. But I can't answer your question any more specifically than that. I can't say, for example, when I have an evil desire, oh, this isn't of me, this is of the devil. I can't do that. It's always of me in the sense that I, I am depraved. But the devil prods and stirs us up. Anyone else? Yes? Re refresh us and then divorce. I have to quit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In school I told you to quit. Now you tell me to quit. <laughs>